Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hi, I'm Steve Heider, Chief of the Colony Police Department. You know, over the past several months, we've talked frequently about crime prevention, how to protect yourself, how to protect your money. And when we look at today's newspapers and watch the local media, we are inundated with stories where people have invested life savings with people, with companies that went bad, that wound up taking their life savings, using it for their own advantage, and leaving people with literally nothing. You know, when we look at this type of victimization, it usually encompasses people of all ages and of all walks of life. And the story we're going to talk about today is a perfect example of that, and one that affected literally thousands of people for billions of dollars. And that's the story of Bernie Madoff, the famous now New York City billionaire who literally took billions from people who had socked that money away, just like you and I, to make for a better future. With me today is Ken Leonard, a certified financial planner from the Sanford Family Financial Group uh, associated with Wells Fargo Advisors. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Kenny, when we, when we talk about Bernie Madoff in a few minutes, you know, we're going to talk about people and their trust that they place in other people to take care of their money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your, your name is followed by that certified financial planner status. And I think it's important to just look, delve into that a, a little bit with your own history mm -hmm. and how you would get to achieve that designation and what does that mean for people as they come forward to want to invest money with who they, who they think they can trust. Well, a certified financial planner is someone who has passed a very rigorous series of exams uh, and coursework with the College for Financial Planning, which is centered in uh, Colorado. And it covers topics ranging from student loans and family budgeting right up through estate planning, retirement planning, taxation, insurance, investments. Uh, it's been referred to as an inch deep and a mile wide. You have to know a lot of things a little bit about a lot of things so that you can refer the heavy duty stuff to the real specialists. Um, it's a uh, five or six or seven course uh, program and then a very rigorous two day exam uh, to, to get your designation. So it's not something that's handled lightly. It, they, you don't clip out a coupon out of a magazine and send in a couple dollars and get that designation. Because one thing we see, you know, if you look at local advertising, if you look at in the phone book, there's a wider range of people who are advertising themselves as financial advisors mm -hmm. and not necessarily with the designation that follows afterward, in fact. And this isn't to take away from some very legitimate people who Correct. are financial advisors. But I think what the designation does in, in your case, it lends hopefully a little bit more credibility to what you're going to be saying to people. The designations of financial advisor, financial planner are unregulated designations. But certified financial planner, and you want to see that R, the little registered trademark after those initials, that is restricted and uh, some very severe fines can come, come about if you use it incorrectly. Uh, those are only people who have passed that certification that I talked about. They have a very stringent code of ethics by which uh, they have to conduct their business, even more stringent than the regulatory agencies uh, that are government sponsored, the SEC, for instance, or the uh, NASD. Now, when we look at the, uh, the whole financial world, and obviously it's been tipsy-turvy over the last two years, um, hopefully it uh, looks like it's on the brighter side now, and we're hopefully coming out of some things. That seems to be the time sometimes when people either A, make mistakes in investing or make mistakes in taking money out of the market or actually could fall victim to a guy like Bernie Madoff. Yeah, um, you know, Madoff is a special circumstance and in doing some research for this show on Madoff, I reached the conclusion early on that I don't know how anybody uh, other than um, a professor, an, ac an academician who, who could really study the markets, could have ever figured out that Bernie Madoff was up to what he was up to. Uh, I don't blame anybody for be having been taken in by him, but it's a good idea to explore just what he did so that you can be on your toes. I think one, the one point I'd like to make, and one thing I noticed by reading the vast news articles that are on this and not totally understanding at all what took place. I think the thing that most surprised me though was that you know when we look at crime and we look at the victims of crime very often we, there are certain people that fall, fall victim to crime more than others. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, people target the elderly. People target people with limited mental capacity. Uh, people target some young people who, want, who like the flash and the flare, so to speak, of the great salesperson. But the one thing characteristic about the Bernie Madoff is if you look at the range of people he dealt with, it was not for profits. It was corporations. It was financial investing firms. It was the individual investor that basically was off the street that heard about him through other people. It was the rich. It was the wealthy. It was the famous. And as you said, you can't blame anybody for doing it because his scheme was so good, it looked perfect. In fact, he didn't even plan this scheme. I think it came about as a result of desperation, maybe uh, some, some things going poorly in the, uh, in the business uh, himself. And I, I think he developed this, and this happens, as you know, very often. It's, it's a temporary thing. I'll borrow some money from the company. I'll pay it back when things get better. I'll take this investor's money. I'll, I'll pretend to invest it, but I'll really pay those who wanted to liquidate their investments out of it, and I'll fix it all later and later never comes. It snowballs and it snowballs and it snowballs. By Madoff's own admission in his sentencing um, uh, testimony, he admitted that this began in 1991. That's an awfully long time to perpetrate uh, a scheme like this. You know, I got to tell you, you know, we've, in my many years in the police department, we've uncovered many schemes of financial fraud, whether it be employee theft um, or embezzlement from a corporation or a company. And typically, the length of time is a lot shorter than 17 or 18 years. Usually, you're found out much sooner than that. And a lot of times, it's because the nature of the scheme that you develop, okay, requires you to be always there. And most internal thefts are discovered by people inadvertently happening upon something. And I guess what's so amazing is Bernie Madoff had a huge office in midtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. He had employees. And to think that nobody caught on for 17 years is just amazing to me. Well, I don't think that's been fully found out yet. I think there's still a lot more to learn about that case. It still boggles my mind that Madoff could have pulled this off single-handedly without any collusion from anybody else. Uh, and I think the investigation will certainly continue. Well, I know the, um, the seizure people, the people that are now looking to find the fruits of his crime so that they can try to return some money back to the investors. I know just recently they filed a huge lawsuit against the family. Mm -hmm. uh, the sons, I think the, uh, the wife. Um, I and think his two, brother and as well. And his brother as well. To the tune of about $192 million in trying to recoup what they profited off the business. But we're talking billions here, not hundreds of millions. And well, it's a figure that you know is just astonishing that somewhere along the line, someone didn't realize what was going on. Or what's more disturbing is that people knew along the line that what was going on, but were profiting from it themselves. Yeah, the, the, the figure of the total scheme that up in the billions is really the result of the false uh, profits that Madoff was reporting. Those 10% annual gains weren't really happening. So he was compounding over 18 years uh, the money that he had taken in from investors. The actual money lost was more modest. It's still a lot of money, right. but it was more modest. Uh, you know, you had all these investment gains that never really were there. It's like buying a house for $200,000, watching the market tell you it grows to $400,000, and then having the real estate market correct and you now own a $200,000 house again. Right. Where did that 200000 of profit go? It was never really there in the first place. But I would imagine at some point over the last uh, 18 years or so that people had gone in to his company made a profit and pulled out. There were people that got liquidations and those liquidations were honored. Uh, unfortunately, they were being paid for by additional deposits from current uh, investors. And that's just a classic scheme. It is. You know, it's a classic Ponzi scheme. And we have seen it locally in the past on a much, much smaller scale. Um, where people, even in one case that I remember, a travel agent was mm -hmm. spending people's money up front on their own likes, taking deposit from other people, and then finally got caught up when she ran out of those deposits to satisfy people's travel needs. And on a simple scale, that's very similar to what Bernie Madoff was doing. Yeah, they, um, there's a famous Warren Buffett saying that you don't see who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. <laughs> it's when the business slows down, then people want liquidations and there's no new money coming in, that, that's when you get found out. What brought him to the forefront now? What is different in two, was different in 2008 and nine versus 1997, 
that made the authorities or made people finally start screaming for something to happen? We had a massive market uh, meltdown in late 2008 in the fourth quarter, a meltdown where the market itself broke. Not so much the securities that were being traded in the markets, but the market itself. Banks didn't trust one another to pay back overnight loans uh, with just a massive seizure of liquidity to where people wanted their money. They wanted cold, hard cash that they could sock away in a mason jar in the basement and wait for this crisis to pass. Madoff undoubtedly got hit with liquidation requests. He didn't have the money to pay the liquidation requests, and no new contributions were coming in. I think it finally caught up with him mentally, had a bit of a breakdown and confessed to family members. He said, it's all one big lie. Uh, I've never invested any money since 1991. You know, when you look at it, though, and I've read some accounts to where it's similar to what you just said, that he just, at some point, when you take that little bit, and we've seen it in some internal thefts where uh, an employee of a shop takes $3.00 and they realize they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And the next day, instead of putting the three back, they take five. And it mounts up and mounts up. Um, did anybody along the line, there's been some reports of one individual yep. who went to the SEC and tried to get them to pay attention. You can, can you delve into that a little bit? And what's fascinating is what his motivation was for looking into this. Harry Markopoulos is a, a forensic accountant, basically. He's got designations galore in terms of being a brilliant financial analyst. He was hired by an investment firm in Boston to study Madoff's investment philosophy and his returns because this company wanted to try to build a model that would replicate Madoff's returns. He was so successful that they were losing market share. They wanted to go after the same clients that Madoff had and get their money under management too. Markopoulos undertook a very, very lengthy study of Madoff's investment philosophy using options, the right to buy and sell securities at a certain price at a future date. And what he determined after exhaustive research was that Madoff couldn't possibly be doing what he was doing on the scale that he was doing it at. Markopoulos said it's either one big giant Ponzi scheme or uh, it's illegal, that well, he was front-running something. And when did he say that? Well, he first approached the SEC. Uh, he began the investigation in 1999, a long time ago. He sent a 21-page memo to the SEC anonymously at first, uh, found it ignored, and uh, went and approached SEC uh, investigators, found a sympathetic ear with one fellow in the uh, Boston SEC uh, office. The firm that employed Markopoulos to study um, Madoff's investment philosophy. Once they found out that they weren't going to be able to replicate it, they dismissed him. And Markopoulos continued this research on his own. Uh, so he didn't do it for anybody. He didn't get paid for it. He did it strictly as an academic challenge. And he felt he was doing, in, in testimony before Congress, he said he felt he was doing a patriotic thing. Uh, but he, he eventually uh, you know, got the SEC to continue to look at it, but by and large, I don't think they had the skill set to reach the same conclusion he did, and I don't think he came with a whole lot of credence for them to rely solely on him. Now, <clears throat> there is regulators that look at operations like Madoff's, correct? Correct. How could they not at all, especially in light of this gentleman's disclosures, mm -hmm. okay, which apparently was no secret with the SEC, right? that this guy was out there was basically saying the sky is falling on Bernie Madoff, mm -hmm. and nobody paid attention. There's a lot of jealousy in, uh, in, in business. If you're a successful entrepreneur of some kind, your competitors are going to try to take you down one way or another. They don't like that. So some of it could have been seen as, you know, this fellow is just trying to tear Bernie Madoff down because he's so successful at gathering assets and managing to a, to a very consistent absolute return. Um, so he, wa he wasn't probably taken with as much credibility, certainly in hindsight, as, as he should have been. Uh, one of the things you look for in an, in an investment is an independent audit of that investment. You want an independent auditing firm to have written an opinion of the investment, to have studied the books, to have dug in and, and, and see what's going on behind the scenes. And that occurred 
with Madoff's firm. He had independent auditors. Unfortunately, it was a three-person outfit uh, whose only client was the Madoff firm, and they were operating out of a little storefront. Uh, Not really independent by anybody's Well, independent, uh, I guess, in, in, in legalese only. Who was paying them? Well, Madoff you, you pays, and of course, every every company that issues securities has to pay the auditor. Right. But usually, it's one of the you know big accounting firms you see that out there, KPMG or you know something like that. Right. In this case, it was it was unique, and it, it was a bit of a red flag. But you know, when you're receiving a regular 10 percent year over year return in good times and bad, you don't look for red flags. Well, and I get <clears throat> greed is a. A wonderful thing for a lot of people, and as you said to the average investor, if they were getting 10 percent when everybody else was losing three, most times those people don't complain. And I guess the bigger question, though, is the was his ability to deal with some very savvy people in investment firms and other types of organizations that dealt with him, that put money with him, and basically be sending out. And I'm making this very simple. Handwritten statements, mm -hmm. okay? When I deal with a company like yours, who do I get the statement? When I, when I call Ken Leonard at Stanford Family Group, mm -hmm. who do I get a statement from? You get a statement from Wells Fargo Advisors. So not, not a thing to do with Ken Leonard. That's correct. And you there's know. also an 800 number that goes directly to Wells Fargo Advisors where you can call and say, here's my account number, here's some identifying information about myself so you know I am who I am, tell me what my balance is. You don't have to rely on me. Somebody else is watching everything I do. So that's a, to me, that's a telltale sign to tell our viewers. Okay, you know, it's no different than you know when I when I do other crime prevention tips. People should have a uh, a backup plan in terms of being able to check out the resources that they're dealing with. Okay, now if we're going to talk about financial advisors, I guess one of those would be not to be suspicious, but to be cautious of people who are giving you their own statements with no attachment to some other firm? Is that, that a safe thing to That say? comes up as a red flag. If you're sold a product by a financial <clears> advisor <throat> who's an independent, and there are great independent advisors out there, years and years in the business, and they might even work out of their homes, that isn't in and of itself a red flag by any means. But if they sell you a John Hancock annuity, get on the phone to John Hancock and have them confirm, because you, if you've <clears> never <throat> bought one before, you don't know what a John Hancock confirmation looks like. You don't know what a statement is supposed to look like. Call the 800 number and check it out. Well, especially with stocks, correct me if I'm wrong, if I go to the, uh, my local financial advisor, okay, which like you said, there's great financial advisors out there. If, I, if he says he's bought me 100 shares of GE stock, mm -hmm. at some point, correct me if I'm wrong, unless I've signed something over to where they're holding it, I should get 100 shares of stock in the mail. Well, the default option is to leave it on account uh, to get an actual certificate these days, it costs money now. Okay. You have to pay a fee to get that. I it, guess it's been a while since it, I bought a stock. I, I, I think, yeah, I think you're back there in the days, Steve. Okay. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of it is kept on, on account. You know, we've, had, we've heard the question before, is all this money real? You know, it's just a piece of paper that says you have X. Right. If you tried to liquidate everything in the country, you couldn't. Right. You know, a lot of it is built up wealth. <clears throat> it's, it's almost out there in the ether. Uh, but um, you know, verify um, and uh, and and trust. That's okay. Trust but verify, I guess. You know, with with Madoff, it's interesting because not only was he producing these returns, and sophisticated people were very very pleased with the returns, but they travel in social and business circles, right. and they tell their associates and their friends how well they're doing, and that just fueled more money coming into Madoff. Well, unfortunately, I mean, we all deal in word of mouth businesses. And a matter of fact, I urge people in dealing with crime prevention tips that you, you should deal with people who you are familiar with or your family is familiar with, people who you've had success with before. Unfortunately, that doesn't work if you have somebody like Bernie who basically had built this house of cards on these relationships. When I wanted to put an alarm system in my house, I made one phone call. That was to you. Steve, who should I deal with? And you know, in, in those type of cases, because we make it a point of being able to provide a number of individuals so that people have, a, have an element of choice, but people that we know in a police department um, have been successful in the past with dealing with people, are trustworthy, they are belong to the proper affiliations, mm -hmm. they know how to handle themselves, uh, so to speak, in a group, okay? And those word of mouth things are very important. They are. 
and that, but people, I guess the point I have to make is that people still have to be cautious. Now, Madoff had been in business since 1960. He was instrumental in helping to develop the NASDAQ, the over-the-counter stock exchange. Yeah. He held uh, positions on the uh, National Association of Securities Dealers. He was, uh, he was Jewish and a Jewish philanthropist, um, so he attracted other Jewish clients uh, and word of mouth spread, and he, there was really no reason not to trust the guy. Uh, it, it, it took somebody who was brilliant at doing forensic accounting to come out and say, I know how the markets work, there's no way he can be doing this with this much money over this long a period of time. Something's wrong. Now, the funny thing is uh, this one guy basically is doing a book report on his company, and that's how easy technically it was to find it out. Well, he spent quite a bit of time researching I it. Make it still, sound very, yeah. I make it sound very simple, but that's, uh, it's funny how in many of our crimes reported to us involving white-collar crime that we've talked about before, um, that's very often how they're discovered. Mm -hmm. It's when a third party just happens to say, you know, I want to take a look at something. But, you know, when you, I'm sure if we look at the history of the financial markets, Berkshire Hathaway. Yep. Um, and his name? Who, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world. I am sure people have done all kinds of studies on his investing schemes. And I shouldn't use the word schemes. <laughs> strategies. <Probably not. laughs> strategies. Um, be, to copy him. Sure. But I guess the one thing they never found was that his is in the house of cards. It is in the house of cards, and he does something that's, uh, that you and I can't ordinarily do, and that's go out and buy controlling interests in entire companies. Right. Um, and, and he does use a formula, but also there's a gut instinct there as to what's a real value and what will do really, really well going forward. And, but, and that's how he amasses his portfolio. And I know he's been studied over and over again but fortunately, he runs a very clean slate of business. That's right. You know, I know locally here, and there's an article recently that we really can't delve into it because it's obviously an open case that we have, my department has nothing to do with, but once again brought to light uh, a situation where people were investing with someone, and now the question has arisen whether or not their money was actually invested. We've seen it with insurance policies. We've seen it with um, health insurance, health care, retirement pension benefits. Um, and I guess the point I need to make uh, for our, our viewers is that, you know, you have to portray a certain amount of due, due diligence. That's right. And to make sure that you've, you've checked out not only the individual you're dealing with, but as you said, this isn't about the Sanford Family Financial Group. This is about Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. Other people may be with one of the other big names that is out there. Right. But there are ways, and I guess that's the biggest point that you made, is that there are ways for people to check. And typically, it's by not calling you, it's by calling the 800 number for the company. Yeah, do, a, do a second check. If, if you say, I have a, an investment with XYZ Mutual Fund Family, and it's held in your you know, firm, well, I'm going to call XYZ Mutual Fund Family and, and, and check on that, see if they have a record of me as well. You know, the two biggest battles that I have, the two biggest threats to someone's financial life are fear and greed. And greed is far more insidious than fear. Right. Fear will keep you out of an investment. Greed will put you into something you have no business being in. The fear still keeps your money in your coffee jug underneath your pillow. Yeah, you'll lose money to taxes and inflation and that sort of thing, uh, but it'll still be there. But it's, it's the greed part that, uh, that I see uh, take people apart. My job is constantly battling those emotions right. with investors. But when you're presented with an investment idea that isn't a vanilla idea, you know, a, a growth mutual fund, shares of GE stock, or, uh, or, or a bond fund, or something like that, if it's some exotic thing, first thing to ask yourself is, does this make sense for me? You know, if you've got a $100,000 IRA and that's all you've got to your name, does it make sense to put 50000 of it in, a, in some oil well that they're going to drill tomorrow in Oklahoma? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, Oceanic exploration used to be a good one. I know some people <laughs> lost money to uh, uh, a group that wanted to explore for a shipwreck off the, yep. off the state of Florida, which, don't get me wrong, it's like winning the lottery. If you hit, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. If you don't, you would have rather had the fear factor than the greed factor. Yeah, you better make sure it's money you can afford to lose. You know, one thing that comes up, uh, just to diverse a little bit, um, and, and we actually get calls on the time. In your industry now, there's a lot of shake, off, shake up in terms of companies disappearing, mm -hmm. companies merging. People who say it would be with Wells Fargo for years, and then all of a sudden Wells Fargo becomes something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, Should they be concerned about that? 
Um, no. Uh, we, we've seen a reshaping of the financial uh, firm's landscape. Once again, we've seen it happen in the past. Um, we made ourselves feel better uh, when all this happened in the last uh, in the last six months of well the last three months of 08 and the first three months of 09 as firms that have been around for decades and sometimes centuries disappeared um, but we've seen it happen before the likes of EF Hutton and Payne Weber and yeah. Dean Witter you know those are names that were in the past that aren't around anymore uh, now our own former company Wachovia became part of Wells Fargo okay uh, that disappeared it was a, uh, a hastily arranged um, you know monitored by the FDIC uh, merger and um, you know thankfully there were strong institutions around that uh, were able to absorb other institutions that needed the help and uh, it's not something that you should be concerned about but you should certainly understand it make the phone calls uh, talk to your advisor you'll always receive correspondence on it but we receive so much that a lot of people don't read it. Well, unfortunately, some of the correspondent is a half an inch thick. Absolutely. And to get the important sentence out sometimes takes an all day of reading. But I guess the, the point I need to make is that when these things happen, though, what happens to the customer's stock? Nothing. Nothing. It's protected. It's protected. And that's the, that's the, that's the my own parents were very concerned whenever they got one of these merger things because yep. they thought that oh my gosh where's my stock going well you know it's not that all too long ago that things weren't protected you know the great depression still exists in the minds of many of our senior citizens and uh, and and many safeguards were put into place after that uh, and thankfully we had them in this last go round yeah because that is a, a major concern we do a lot with seniors groups okay and a major concern of them is that they get these things and things change names they don't want to see any change at all and I actually had to talk for some of them about 20 minutes on the phone trying to explain to them that just because the name changed, right. don't think that your stock just went out the window. Oh, no. You know, it was held by a company. You know, and even after explaining it to them, it's funny how people are. The one instance I'm talking about, their son and daughter had taken care of setting up the accounts, had made sure that everything was in the right place, had reaffirmed to them that it's okay, this is coming, and this is okay. The very similar thing what happened with Covey and mm -hmm. Wells Fargo. These people stood and believed their own children mm -hmm. and called their local police department to make sure that their money wasn't flying out the window somewhere. Right. In just a minute or two, quick tips. How do people address all this confusion and massive information that's bombarding them now between CNBC, MSNBC, every stock channel, everything where you look, you walk into any bank or credit union, they got TVs on, blaring mm -hmm. the Dow on the bottom of the screen. How do people deal with it? Information overload. Turn the TV off. It, it, it's almost like raising children again. You can watch TV between 8 and 9. After that, it's homework and bed. Pick a time during the day when you're going to watch TV. Maybe it's headline news where you'll just pick up a half an hour and get the, the, the surface of it, and that's all you need. Pick somebody you like and trust. I watch Larry Kudlow on CNBC. That's the one show I'll watch from start to finish. And I, I, I trust him, I believe him, I don't think he's too much of an optimist or too much of a pessimist. And he's got guests on all the time that you know, share their insight. Uh, but if you watch it 24 hours, remember what the motivation of these networks are. It's to keep eyeballs on the screen so they can sell advertising. Now, uh, a year ago this past summer, we had two-hour specials every night. America's oil crisis, the coming doom. Everything was going to fall apart. Uh, oil went up to $147 a barrel as we watched these shows, and it subsequently went down into the $30 a barrel range. Uh, don't worry about everything the networks say you have to worry about. Their motivation is to keep your eyeballs on the screen and sell advertising. Yeah, you, you, know, you mentioned <clears throat> information overload, and that's a, a huge thing. You know, there was a time when most people never even looked at the stock page in the paper. And now they're following stocks at their computer, at their desk, on a literally hour-to-hour -hour basis. And you won't find the stock pages in many <clears throat> of the papers anymore. No, they've done away with they've it. They've done away with them. You know, they'd rather have you go online and, and look. Yep. And unfortunately, there's too much information sometimes on that online situation. There is. Bernie Madoff, one thing that people could have done or that people can do in the future to not fall victim to it. Uh, diversify. Don't have all your eggs <clears throat> in one basket. Um, Kevin Bacon, uh, the actor. He and his wife had their real estate that they owned, their checking account, and every other dime was with Madoff. Um, diversify. There is a place for money that you need and can't have anything happen to it. It's called the bank. It might pay 0.4% interest, 
but there's a reason to keep money in the bank. Uh, there's a bank money and there's investment money. Investment money is long term. Make sure it's diversified. Get a second opinion on it. Talk to your relatives, talk to friends, talk to coworkers, talk to people you trust, get referrals, get references, and research, research, research. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. You know, when we look at it on a day-to-day -day basis and from a police department standpoint, many of our cases come nowhere near what Bernie Madoff created in New York City and basically throughout the country because of the amount of reach that he had with clients throughout the world. The tips that we've heard today hopefully will help you all make those right decisions, make those right investments to protect your future, to protect your children's future, and to make it so that we have a much safer society. I want to thank you for watching today and have a good day. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Thank you.